Design Salvation, Episode 70. This is Design Salvation, your lifeline to better design with Dixie and Annie. Our mission is to share our conversation with you so we can all elevate our work and lifestyle. Welcome to The Fold. This episode is sponsored by the Seattle Design Center. Since 1973, the Seattle Design Center has served the design community, design enthusiasts, builders, and architects alike. With more than 500 manufacturers represented in its 20-plus showrooms, it is a destination for creativity, imagination, and inspiration. This is the Pacific Northwest epicenter for sourcing the highest quality of diverse luxury products for the home. Check them out in Seattle's Georgetown neighborhood, Monday through Friday, 9 to 5, or go to seattledesigncenter.com. Hey, y'all. It's Dixie Stark. And Annie Lundquist. We're Design Salvation. It's a beautiful fall day out there. Oh, understatement. I know. It's we had a monsoon kinda, earlier we in the day. We had a though. monsoon all night and Gosh. early in the day, and now it's glistening and perfect, and the leaves are rustling because it's super it's beautiful w- wonderfully windy and blue sky. We're at your house today. It's going to be perfect for our topic, I think. Oh, what's our topic? Well, I was going to talk about reupholstery. Oh, right. That's right. We threw that around. That's a good topic. Yeah, okay. It's a really good okay. topic. Yeah. Okay. But being at your house is really good. Okay. Well, mm, yeah, we'll get back to that. Yeah. Okay. We'll get back to that. Yeah, we're, we, I did go outside today in the wind, and I realized, I took some cute pictures because my house is like a redhead. Oh, right? it is like the a vines, redhead. The it vines is on so top beautiful. are so red, red, red right I now. I have something really funny. So when I was in college, my sophomore year— in studio, we were asked to design a restaurant or restaurant yeah, yeah. slash bar. Sure. And we had to come up with the name and we had, and this is before graphic design. This is before, you know, that was even popular or a thing. It was before, you know, any computers or anything. And they were like, okay, so you've got to come up with the name. You have to come up with what the staff is wearing. So it was oh, a branding and everything. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Guess Fun. what I named my bar? <laughs> what? Kind of funny. Red Ivy. Red Ivy. That's cool. Wouldn't that be a good bar? That would be a good bar. I did not get a good grade on that project. Then. What the heck? Oh, I got a B. B oh, minus. That's a good, but oh, it, but, B it, minus but I was like, he, he, the dude didn't get it. I thought it was so cool. But I think anyways, you were ahead your, house, of your time. Your house would have been fabulous for my bar. <laughs> yeah, we could have a bar in here. Red Ivy. I thought that was good. Actually, that place over right over there in the corner of the dining room looks like a damn big. It, it does. Big but bar. It looks good. <laughs> it looks so good. Hey, I we, like what we're drinking. I though. like what we're drinking today. I think it's seasonal. It does feel seasonal. You know, I thought about, you're going to think I'm really crazy. But after I got so far down in this drink, I wondered if it needed just a little hint of cinnamon. Oh, that'd be nice. Well, you know, okay, so we're drinking a cranberry a sparkling rosé. So yeah. we just put cranberry juice in and then the sparkling rosé, and then we put orange in. But you can orange also, twist. you know what I read? I was looking up some different options on this, and you can put orange bitters in, a couple little drops. That would be good. That would be good. Because that's already got the little mm-hmm. bit of, um, you know, kind yeah. of Yeah. But you can also do frozen cranberries in here for more festive, like, holiday things. I love the way this things. looks. I know. We put ours in, in mason jar. Mason jars. I love it. It's but fun. I was just thinking, I was like, you know what? You could put either a stick. Of That'd be cute. Cinnamon, which would be super cute. Or you could just eat a little bit of cinnamon. I think it would be a good kind of offset to the orange and the rosé. But anyways, two ingredients, or people. A ro- uh, two ingredients. That's Dixie's limit oh, no. for a good Love drink. It. And you could also do a rosemary sprig with the cranberries on, pierced on it. Oh, that'd, that'd be, be really pretty, too. Did we do that before? Uh, Maybe it's because we're eating these and these have a little cinnamon to them. The ginger cookies. Yeah, the ginger Anna's. cinnamon There's, business. They're good. I don't know. But anyways, side note, that was I was just thinking about that after the fact. So okay, I'm going to digress you? one more time. Okay. Well, oh. We just, <laughs> sorry, because we all can't travel. And I, everyone was telling me, watch Emily in Paris. Oh. So we watched it. And? It's darling. The first episode, because I get cranky with American shows. I'm like, the acting's oh, no. over and the writing's not that clever. And blah, blah. But it's good. It's good. And it's frivolous and fun. Uh, Netflix. Netflix. Yep. Okay. Easy to watch. Our 10 episodes. Boom, boom, boom. What is, what is it again? 
Emily and Paris. Emily Paris, and Paris looks divine. Do you think I can talk Jay into that? No. Mm-mm. Okay. No. That'll be it. On that my was your own, own little sitch. thing. But okay. I think you'll like it. Just get past the first episode and then. Okay. I think you'll like good. it. It's cute. Oh, so was. It's kind of Sex in the City, but a little tamer and sweeter. And she's young and darling. And it. she's trying to make her way in the marketing world with all these <gasps> snobby French people. It's a little stereotype. It's, oh, it's, it's, it's interesting. But it, does it have a lot of um, like. Paris in the background. Yes. Oh, see, tons. that's what I'm going to soak up. Completely. Every time they're, I watch no, something, and they're at like the, you know, like Le Du Mago and those oh, cafes. They're, yeah. No, they're right where you'll recognize. I'll recognize yeah. where, oh my gosh, where it's all shot. Yeah. Dee kept love saying, that. well, they're really in nice places in Paris, aren't they? Because he hasn't been there. And I'm like, oh, baby. Everything looks like <laughs> this. <laughs> yeah. You have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, everything looks like that. That's yeah. so great. Every Everything's corner, so every great. little street. Mm-hmm. I'm going to have to do that, especially as we go into this kind of wintry, you know, well, it's fall first, but you know, it's wintry weather. I need something in the evening to just. It'd be good. To. I think you'll like it. Um, we'd been watching a heavier series with a lot of shooting that I really like. Yeah, I, yeah, justified. It was from yeah. a few years ago, and this was really this welcome. Really good. Really good. Okay, oh. thanks for the tidbit. Yeah, there you go. That's okay, my happy tidbit. tidbit. Okay, okay, let's talk. You know what? Let's do talk about a reupholstery. Upholstery. Yeah, well, you and I have been kind of like powering through. Just all the things that <laughs> we're working with these clients that we've worked with from a bajillion years ago because they're all working from home and they've all kind of reemerged. I need to mm-hmm. reupholster this or I need that or I need this because they're at home due to the COVID, you know, protocols. And, you know, it's it's kind of interesting what has surfaced. I have so much reupholstery work out there right now. It is yeah, I get Believe that. I, I, I've i witnessed that too with clients. Yeah. And, and not only that, my list is getting longer and okay, longer so and more pressing. I want a confession now to you. How much reupholster? I mean, we walk around your house and every time you go, oh, oh I'm going to reupholster that. Oh, I'm going to redo those. <laughs> and I'm like, I a lot of times don't think they need to be redone. Mm-hmm. But okay, what do you think you've got? Well, it is true that I've been in a holding pattern because of the expense, which is fine. The chairs can, they're fine. Of course. But because I am home a lot You're more, noticing it too. Mm-hmm, and so my list is growing. And How many you think you got? I, oh, I don't, I am, I, this is a big confession. I, mean, I don't know. Because I have my whole bed, I have a bunch of chairs in my bedroom. I have all my dining room chairs to reupholster. Goodness. I have these little side extra dining chairs to reupholster. What do you have, 20 pieces? Maybe with the dining chairs, that we could lump those together as one. Oh gosh, no, I have more like 40. <laughs> <laughs> that's some bank. Well, it is some bank, and that's why I have to oh, be man. super patient. Yeah. And, and and happily, I have pieces that, like we said, that they, they aren't in a major emergency. People who came in and didn't know would be like, oh, that, that looks that's yeah, fine. That's fine. Yeah. It's fine. And I have a couple of chairs. The other thing is I have a chair uh, obsession. Okay, I do too. Yes. That, I don't, you know what? I've read that about other designers in books. I've read that about like Thomas O'Brien. I've heard him say mm-hmm. that numerous times, maybe even when he spoke to us, you know, at the design center way back in the day. Daryl Carter has said the same mm-hmm. thing in his books. I mean, I've heard that from Suzanne Kaysler, well, chairs, I mean, everybody. Uh, chairs have personality. They have and personality. And I think more than anything else, more than a sofa, obviously, or a console or something. They're easy to acquire. They're easy to acquire. They're easy to remedy if they need a little kick in the pants. Yeah. And, and there's something about filling up a corner with a with a chair. That, a charming chair. A charming chair. Well, and I've seen you do this, and I've done this before, too, where literally if a chair's got personality, but maybe it's not a sitable surface. Mm-hmm. Yes. And I don't want people to sit in it. Mm-hmm. Then I'll put something like a stack of books, yep. or you know, I'll do something with it so that it's not usable, but it works more as a piece of art or the filler or the exactly. interesting object. Well, and I think too, the great thing, for example, in in guest rooms, you have to have yeah. a chair in the corner. They have to have a place to sit and put their shoes on, or lay their robe, or their clothes, or stack up mm-hmm. something <laughs> with their clothes. I mean, that is just a great place. Too. Yeah, because guest rooms typically aren't super big, and so mm-hmm. you need something in the corner, and you put a beautiful chair there, you're done. The other thing I've done, and I'm sure you have too, is sort of with the extra chairs that can't mm-hmm. go around the dining room table, but with 
clients who entertain a lot is to uh, have chairs that are versatile or put a little slip cover on them and then whip the slip cover off when you need Love more dining. That. Yeah. Love that because idea. Because you can put one up at a desk. You could put one in a corner of a guest room, as of we course. said. You could just have them up against the wall. In I love a chair mm-hmm. and an entry. I love we a chair. We talked about mm-hmm. that before. Mm-hmm. So I am really particular about reupholstery. I know you are too. And mm-hmm. I know that's part of the reason that when we go to have things reupholstered, it's not a slam, bam, thank you, ma'am, done situation. It's details, 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 details. So it's not only appropriately selecting the right fabric for a piece because, you know, the thickness of the fabric, especially like mohairs that want to smile, if, you know, you crease them too much or something that maybe perhaps is not upholstery weight, it's too thin for the frame. I mean, there's lots of things to consider when you go to reupholstery. Is it going to show the wear in a way that your client isn't going to appreciate? Right. All yeah. of those all of those things have to be considered. And, and a lot of times when I am uncertain, I will consult with the upholsterer. And yeah, exactly. I'll be like, hey, you know, I'm wondering if you think this is going to be difficult to accomplish or, you know, if you had poor experience with this or what have you. But I do, um, I do love, uh, depending on the project and the client, a really experienced upholsterer. And I have gotten into once um, recently a bad upholstering job. Oh. It, it rarely happens. And uh, it was, it was just painful and expensive. It is. Yeah. Because you you know, and I didn't even honestly vet the chair properly before mm-hmm. it left the workroom. And so the client noticed it because I had just assumed that it would be done Perfectly. Of course. And we were way off the mark for whatever reason. And every, you know, so every workroom has a bad day. Of course. And of course. It was a bad day. Well, and sometimes I've noticed, and this is one of the questions that I ask, is I like to know if the person that's doing, you know, one particular facet or one phase of whether it's a sofa or whether it's a chair, if if they're staying on the job. I always request if it's a bigger workroom that the same person, even if he has to take off three days or whatever it is, the same upholster works on that oh, piece all the way through. Idea. I because done that. Because if someone else mm-hmm. takes over, yep. you have the same problem you have when you start and stop anything. It's a shift of your pen if you're writing a letter or it's, you know, a paint job that you can tell someone else was holding their hand at a different angle or something than someone else. You can just tell that it's been started and stopped by multiple people. So I'm usually pretty particular about that. And I want want the same person to work Mm -hmm. on that piece. But um, that's a great idea. And I I do find that the the more experienced workrooms ask you the right questions. They do. They lead you to the finish line in grand form if they know what they're doing. That's exactly right. Always, you know, if I have questions about my chair or my sofa or whatever, I never worry about it because I know I'll be consulting with the experts. Of course. And we'll solve it. And there have been multiple times, obviously, they'll get to a certain point and they'll be like, we yeah. need to we need to have a consulting yeah, situation yeah. here where we all look at it and try to figure out the best solution. Well, I've noticed that when I go to do reupholstery of like antiques, and mm-hmm. this is evident in the pieces that you have here, and I'm sure you're going to have to address that if you do reupholster some of these pieces, where if you have an old frame, you've got to have some sort of trim piece that connects the fabric to the frame because what happens is Mm -hmm. the frame's so dang old with Mm -hmm. antiques that there's imperfections and a lot of times you can't even get the fabric straight. Or there are a million nail holes, million nail head holes or, you know, from the previous one. And it's just 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 so disintegrated in so many ways. So that's why um, a lot of times you'll see, for those of you that are kind of looking at antiques or looking to reupholster antiques, you you got to consider that you're going to have some sort of trim detail. It could be a flat gimp. It could be a double welt. Mm -hmm. It could be nail head. I have a pet peeve about nail heads. Well, let's hear your pet peeve. I just I'm sure we share. I just it. I just can't stand big nail head. Yeah. No. What what who did I what don't know. Is that? I think I d- I cannot do it. I think Wayfair did that. Oh, <laughs> they should be shot. Yeah. Um no, it's just so unfortunate. No, I like this quarter inch, you know, yeah. down 
Down, exactly. And I've seen some really cool teeny, teeny, tiny ones that are a flat head. Have mm-hmm. you seen those? They're more I like have. a little true nail. It's clever. I don't think it works on a lot of applications, and it wouldn't particularly on an antique because you have the spacing between. Exactly. So again, and there's a lot of trim out there that's gorgeous. And we're all ooing and aahing, but yeah. it's not use it's not user friendly at all. No, and it has limited, limited application. It's one of the things I'm. I think you've said this too. I wish the showrooms would show it applied, right? That carry the big lines like Samuel and Sons, of course. And I know that's an additional expense, but I think Samuel and Sons would it would behoove them to show. to show how best to use these, and it might actually spark some additional. Creativity. Creativity, because there's a ton of trim out there where you're just ooing and aahing it and literally can't be used unless it's on a skirt. uh, Yeah, exactly. I was just about to say the only thing that I can think of application-wise where if you have these big tassels, especially some of the tassels, you know, they're basically a wood foundation, a wood bead that Mm -hmm. actually gets wrapped with the silk or whatever, uh, rayon fiber or whatever it is. Um, you so can't go on a pillow because you can't so, sit no, against it. No, you can't use that. And mm-hmm. if you put it on draperies, you got to be super careful because it's so heavy. Mm-hmm. So the only thing I can think of is a you know a heavy duty skirt that might be on a larger piece of upholstery like a sofa or a settee mm-hmm. or something. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's got that. But beyond that, like you said, it's not useful. No, and there's a lot of it out there. Like I I like a brush fringe. I mean, I haven't. It's mm-hmm. sort of coming back in. It is. I'm <laughs> noticing it. Which I like it, but it has to, for me, it has to be super dense, not floppy, Mm -hmm. you know. Agreed. Yeah. Because if it gets floppy and too long, Mm -hmm. again, it's, it doesn't lay right. And And sometimes you can, you can have them trim it or Mm -hmm. you can double it. You can do like a double brush if it's too skimpy. I've never had somebody trim. Mm -hmm. But it scares me. Yeah. I've had. But I've even seen it on like a berger on the cushion now. It's coming back. I I, know. I I, kind of. Like it. I know. I don't, I don't see myself doing that actually, but I could see doing it for someone who is the right that, yes, that yeah. actually would appreciate it. Mm-hmm. I'm fascinated by all the trimmings. I have a tendency to always go more towards the understated, simplistic yes. approach. Mm-hmm. But there is there is a place. There's a place for it, and I think judicious use of it just makes it all the more spectacular. I, well, I do too. How do you feel? Mm-hmm. Okay, so I kind of have a pet peeve about this too. Okay. I've done it before, uh-huh. but I'm very picky about it. How do you feel about having like multiple fabrics or like a fabric and leather combination on one piece? Mm-hmm. I've, I rarely, I rarely, rarely do it, but do I've done it. it. I don't like it. I like the back of a certain type of chair. Yeah, I like this a oval Louis, chair. Louis 16. Can, I like the back to be different. I love that. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just another avenue of just oh, I think putting a little piece of personality on something. But mm, I know. So mm-hmm, I've, mm-hmm, I've, mm-hmm. It, what I have done before, and I've been okay with it, is having the seat in like a leather because they're just so yes. worried about it. Yes. So like on this oval um, mm-hmm. chair here that you have, the Louis Sixteen, we were just talking about. It's an oval back, and and the back is separated from I the seat. That. The seat could have leather on it, and then the back yeah. can have its own. That textile. would actually look. That fine. would work. Mm-hmm. But I have been very very resistant to a lot of that. I've been more inclined to say, hey, let's do the upholstery all in one thing. And then I'm I'm not opposed to a leather, a small, small leather welt. Mm-hmm. Just um, maybe it's that added pop or maybe it's it's just a durability situation because the welt is one of the things when it's it's raised on upholstery in particular, it gets wear. You know, it does get wear. wear. Well, it's interesting too because I put a really, well, I thought I put a simple gimp on a, some mm-hmm. dining room chairs that I did for myself a few years ago prior to these being the dining room chairs. <laughs> okay. You know, we're, we're designers. Yeah, we, we change. change. It just so, happens. Okay, but confession. I, I, <laughs> it had a tiny little loop on the leading edge. Uh, the square. Was it a gimp? What was back. it again? It was a gimp. Oh, it was a gimp. Okay. Um, and... Well, I guess it or was a flat it, gimp. A flat yeah, gimp. Flat yeah, gimp. It was a t- yeah, the tiniest. Little, well, the t- the little loop part would flip up a little bit. You know, wouldn't sit flat because you oh, can't glue because, it because because the piece glue. was crowned too a little. Yeah, bit. and the piece was crowned, and so you know these things are where a really good upholster might anticipate this, and in that case, might not. Yeah, that that's a tricky one. That's I'm a not sure. Tricky one. I just find trim. To be, like, I'll, I'll pull a million samples from the showroom and yeah, get home too. and be like, Annie, this is yeah. not user-friendly. 
You're just, yeah. Yeah, it's just a pretty thing to look at. I love the sample card. It, it, the sample <laughs> card's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Let's pin it up. It doesn't and have its place it. right mm-hmm. now. Let's it put it on the, on the working board, but we're not working with it. Yeah, exactly. But I, I just was curious about that. You know, we talked about this before where uh, you see some pieces that are antiques maybe sometimes where you don't reupholster them. You just let them be in the old like muslin they're in or, or, yeah. and those are the ones that I think of as just being in the corner and you don't really use or what have you, but. I have one up in my bedroom that do you? would be the easiest and. I don't think probably, I've seen it. Uh, it used to be in the living room. I don't think okay. you've seen it either. It has an old green antique damask on it. And then the back of it has this faded red Ooh. that's gone kind of raspberry. You love raspberry. And it's torn. Oh. And I can't give it up. I just, I can't. I just love I, it. Mm. You just love it. I love it. Oh. And the wood's so pretty on it. And all of it just looks all There's nice. There's something really lovely about the chair. You know how Kim always talked about the antiques that were rubbable. There's yeah, something really lovely chair, about I'm a, a very well, well-loved, mm-hmm. well-used piece of upholstery. So quite a few episodes ago, we did some, we chatted about a fellow who had a very chic Parisian apartment with very art deco and... and, and What was that? Super sleek. I, I can't remember, but I recall him saying that his very favorite piece was a chair that he purchased, his very first purchase was a big splurge for him. And it's some sort of Victorian tufted thing that's all worn and torn and faded. And he's just kept it. And he's kept it just yeah. like that in his super chic apartment. And it's still oh. his favorite thing. Yeah, and see, there's, there's nothing wrong with, wrong with that. that. No. There's nothing wrong with that. Have you ever gone to like the Goodwill or for I've, sure. I've pulled things out of the dumpsters before? I have too. You can get a $10 chair and make it look like a million bucks. It's going to cost you. Best. You do. And so reusing is one of my favorite things to do because, you know. Well, I, it's upcycling. It's upcycling. Yeah. I appreciate that. And you've got a thing with beautiful bones or the right proportions. But it isn't, you know, my clients always say, but why wouldn't we just get a new one? I know. I have clients <laughs> ask me that all the why time. Why wouldn't we just get new if it's the same price or even maybe more? Exactly. I said, well, because we love this piece and we can get exactly what we want and we don't have to Pick. Reinvent I mean, the wheel. You don't have to no, reinvent the wheel. And I don't know about you, but I have a lot of clients who, because if the fabric's included, they really want to try and use the included fabric. And uh-huh. I rarely do. So right. sometimes you can do that success, very successfully. Yeah, but I've there been are able other times where that. once you put the COM on there, it's so expensive. It's so expensive anyway. It's like Exactly. And the COM is customer's own material, which always drives me crazy. I want to say clients, or I want to say designers specified material. <laughs> I want to call it DSM instead of COM, mm-hmm. but okay, whatever. But yeah, the COM can really drive it up because you're paying for the labor and you're paying for the fabric. And then the two mm-hmm. combined is oftentimes as much as a sofa, if not more. Mm-hmm. But you know, I always say to clients, I'm like, you know, if this is a piece, it's like a house. If this is a piece that has good bones Mm -hmm. and you know that it's got good bones, beautiful lines, it has functioned for you well, it fits the space, you know, it's everything that you really want except for the fact that you want a different fabric on it, Mm -hmm. that's when you need to reupholster it Yeah. instead of buying something completely new. I'm with you. I like to reupholster when I can. I also think that that's a dying art, and I mm-hmm. look at reupholstery as art. I would agree. I would totally it's, agree. It's like any custom sewing. It's like custom draperies and pillows and even the jeans I'm learning how to patch and repair. <laughs> like, it is an art form that I feel like has been lost. And so when I can encourage a client to reupholstery, reupholster rather than buy new I have a tendency to want to start there. I don't always get I there. I do, too. But I try to start I there. I always somewhere. try to start there. I think there's something kind of wrong about throwing out the perfectly I know. proportioned piece of furniture. But And one of the reasons upholstery is a dying art form is because the big box retailers scoop oh, yeah. up all of, and pay them more and give them oh, health yes, they do. Care Healthcare and, 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 and I get that. And so the I mom and it, pop but, little shops mm, and the, they the lose one-offs. Good people. Have lost their good really good people. So, you know, it's just it's just something that really is still of great interest to me. I'm fascinated by it. I love the transformation. It's like blowing out your kitchen and, and doing it something is. different there. It's a transformation. Well, or it's like it's like when you wallpaper a room. Oh. Just it <laughs> just is like such yeah. a, a beautiful, like 
change. Any, anytime you do something with fabrics that's custom, like your seamstress works with your beautiful fabrics, it always blows me away at how they look when everything's made. I know. Up. And it's a special thing. It's something probably a lot of you, it resonates with y'all too, where it just comes to life. There's something about the beauty that you create through these things, and then they become something more. They do. And for those, you know, textile designers, we've mentioned this before, like Greer and like Alice. And, Mm -hmm. you know, even I just had a meeting with Jennifer West, who has her own textile line now. And Mm -hmm. just the, the way that we as designers choose to use those textiles and create a new art form in a totally different, Mm -hmm. like, you know, perspective and a totally different setting is fascinating to them. So I think it's just, I don't know, everything about it, I'm really, I don't know, I'm enamored by it. I've always loved it. I'm enamored with it too. And I'm going to throw something out here because we we looked at a book that we considered. Ooh. Right? Yeah. And it was the... I can't remember. You're looking at me and I don't know what you're talking about. It was Natalie Farmer's book. um, Oh, yeah. And she has a textile line. Yes, yes. Decor Barbar, I think I'm saying We did look at that book. We looked at that book. And and I would love if anyone has any feedback on that style, which has a lot of layered pattern that... Is a little um, Madeline Casting. Madeline Casting uh-huh. meets Russia. Yes. Um, you know, I it's interesting, and the, and then the, the designers are wearing sort of the folk kind prairie of prairie wear. dresses. Yeah, I'm interested. Yeah. And everyone's painting their trims these deep, deep colors, and then wallpaper, a lot of wallpaper, pattern on pattern and pattern. And, and I, then I just, layers of like art and dishes and all sorts yeah, of stuff on top of it's that. It's a very, it's not minimal. It's very maximalist, and uh, it's it's very, it's sort of the new boho. It is the new. boho. I don't know what they call it. It's a I little. I don't either. Do we, it's are a we little out, bit like grandma not, would love it. Well, yeah, because but it goes back to it, those pleated shades that yeah. I. I have a problem with. I know you. I know. Do. I, I like them, you but I have more them. house that can handle them. And you yeah, I, I, yeah. I. I don't know. I. I, I have think some you s- hate them because you're seeing the pleated shades thrown into every setting where they don't belong. That's what it is. I, I think feel it's like more they're not that. appropriate for yeah. everywhere because when we were looking at the book, I did like yes. the way it looked, and in the it book. was the right place. It for was it. the right place. Yeah. I will put that book up on the uh, show notes. Put the book up. I think I think I a think lot of people would love it because it is sort of this trending current thing. And I do like the layering and the mm-hmm. fact that it looks collected and it's not uber thought through, even though I know it is. Of course it is. But, um, but there's also some part of me that's like, I just think they're trying too hard. Maybe. Maybe. it's You know, it's funny. It, again, it goes back to me with the details. Like if the details are good, then I... I can handle it, you know? Yeah. I like and, the I, and I would say good. this too. Things like that that are really complex don't always photograph the way they feel in person. Correct. It's really interesting because I've been in some homes like that that are so extraordinary and fun. And there's all these, a surprise there's around a surprise, every corner. Exactly. Yes. And they're just delightful places to be and, and have dinner in and live in. And um, But they and the photograph heavy. Busy. Yeah. yeah. Busy and heavy. heavy. And that's why I think there's been a, a total trend and and just kind of like we were talking about photography in last week's episode, which was, what, 69? And how minimalism kind of works Mm -hmm. where photography is concerned. I think that's a really good point, Annie, in that sometimes those spaces don't photograph as well. Mm -hmm. It just, it's a little, even if you strip it down, it wouldn't look right. Yeah. It's visually overwhelming. But I think it's so interesting when you go into a space and you experience it and you look around and, and there's just another little detail or another little layer I don't know that I'm very good at that, but it's not your stick, it's, and, and it's no, it's, it's not appreciated. Yet. I know when it's done right, it's it is pretty special because it's really hard to do. Oh, it's I hard know. to do. It reminds me uh, in a different way because his is a super uber elevated Rothschild kind of mm-hmm. vision. Is that Fifth Avenue book that we talked about early, early on? It's not for everybody either. Um, Oh, my gosh. But it's the same play. Who's that designer? I, Dang it. i blanking out on everything today. Slotkin. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Slotkin. It's yep. an amazing book where the closet is completely fitted and kitted. Decked and out to yeah. the nines. So, anyway. I mean, every little detail. But I, I think, you know, with so many do-it-yourselfers, they, they like that look, but they go towards the minimalist look because they can do that. 
Yeah. So I, I, I it'll just be interesting to see this in both evolution. situation. I, I keep preaching this, but I'm like, in both situations, the details have to be right. And if the mm-hmm. details aren't right, and neither style or approach is going to be successful. Yeah. It's just not. So speaking of which, we get to um, we get to do a live stream. It's not going to be one of our podcasts, but we I get to do it the was. live stream. I was really off on that. So if I said well, something in our stories, I'm no, sorry. No, 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 I did no. Say what something. it is is, is it's gonna, <laughs> no, it's going to be a live uh, a live stream where we're not in control of all the ins and outs and technical things. Thank goodness, Thank goodness, because mm-hmm. I wouldn't know what the heck to do without Jay or Chris. But anyways. We get to be at the design center and we get to kind of like bring mm. in the the tail end of what is their we virtual get to market hand out week. The fun prizes we too. get to do all the fun prizes and you know that's that is your plethora and place to get like fabulous fabrics and all sorts of great furniture and things. But even even if you're just using an entity of the design center, it is the best resource we have. And I, I would encourage everyone. I I remember early early on, I was a little daunted and intimidated. I go in very quietly. I think I've mentioned this before and. And then, you know, but making friends and building relationships with those showroom owners so and the helpers, they know so much. They and really even do. though we think we know a lot, they really know the fabrics. They do. How they should be used and, and whatnot. And I love that place as and all as the, the new best technology. Resource, you it, know, because mm-hmm. the the technology of the fabrics helps yes. know what the use might. Well, and that's, be. you know, the fabrics are expensive. So if you want to sell the product, you better know. You better mm-hmm. be able to tell the client why it costs so much. Well, that's exactly <laughs> right. Because it, it, it is, it is. It's Whether a, it's hand embroidery or the technology that, you know, made it cost a lot. You, yeah. There's a reason. Yeah. There's because a it's reason. Bulletproof or what have you. But yeah, so we get to do that. That's towards the end of the month. That'll be on, um, I don't know, the, 20, the 29th, 9th, I, think. I believe. Thursday. And so people have to tune into that. They can basically, I think, go to the seattledesigncenter.com yep. and then it'll be it'll be streaming live on their different platforms. But that's going to be totally fun. I'm really, really looking forward to it. Me I love, I want to, it's just so hard to thank the Design Center for all the help <laughs> they've given us over the decades. All and of us designers. Yeah, all I of mean, us designers. We really do appreciate it. Yeah. But anyways, we look forward to it. We hope you're having a happy fall. Happy fall. I'm finally really in the mood, like, to put stuff, pumpkins and gourds around. Pumpkins and gourds Mm -hmm. and light your candles and have a tasty little drink like we did. Yes. Enjoy. We'll talk to you next week. Ciao for now. Ciao for now. Hey, y'all. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. You can also find us at designsalvation.com, where we'll have the past podcasts listed as well as show notes. Hope to see you there.